today I'm going to draw some dragons and little reptilian creatures. All of the dragons that I draw, I am creating them from pulling different body parts and different characteristics from creatures, reptiles that actually exist. So I'm always looking through, you know, Google and Pinterest, trying to find really cool new reptiles with interesting characteristics that I can pull from for my dragons. So for example, if I am studying a horned lizard, they have this really cool double horned structure on their head. So when I'm studying them, I'll be making note of this really interesting swoop double horn structure, kind of leading up to the horns in the back of their head. And I'm always making note of these kind of characteristics. And then when I want to take those and put them on my own creatures, so I'll take like, for example, this front plane here, it's got this kind of triangular front plane of the head and we can just extend that, make it even bigger and pointier, kind of copy that, that flat front of the face, that slanted eye. And then we can give it maybe instead of just two layers, it's got even more layers. It's got three layers of horns. And maybe we even take these horns on the side of the cheek and extend them out further. And suddenly we've got our own dragon creature design that we have pulled the pieces from actual creatures that exist. So when I'm studying reptiles from our world, I'm always thinking about how I can take the characteristics that I'm seeing and kind of stretch them out elongate them, maybe give them additional pieces, like split one horn into two, or we can even do something like making it twist, kind of like a unicorn horn, figuring out how we can take the pieces that are there and transform them into something totally new and different. And something that I'm always keeping in mind is I'm trying to break the planes of the body down into their most simple forms. So, you know, we're always thinking about how we can use cylinders, triangular shapes, and cubes, how we can turn our creatures into these simple building blocks. So for example, like if I am studying a leopard gecko, I'll notice that the face has this kind of half cylinder shape across the eyes. And when I'm originally studying these creatures, that's what I'm trying to commit to memory this kind of flat plane across the top of the head. When I'm studying, I'll use a lot of these form wrapping lines like this that help me make sense of the three-dimensional forms that I'm seeing and commit them to memory. These most simple forms, when we put them down first lightly, then when we're adding on top of them for our own creatures, when we're adding our details, we can really expand on them. We've got these simple forms that we remember and we can pull details from different creatures. We can take the simple basic head shape of this is like a leopard gecko. And then we could take something from a crested gecko. Like for example, they have these really cool kind of like eyelash like spikes right on the eyebrow ridge here. Bearded dragons have these really cool spikes on the bottom of their cheek, but maybe we kind of take this crested gecko pattern and combine it with the location of bearded dragon spikes and suddenly we've, we're starting to build our own little reptile creature. You can take it a step further. Maybe we want to add a different eye shape, like this kind of slanted eye shape that's sitting inside this larger circular form from the horned lizard. We can add that into our creature, still keep, you know, little eyebrow, little eyelash shapes. We can also stretch the shapes. So once we know that this face, we know kind of like the basic way that the forms turn, we can just stretch that out. So maybe this is a much longer face like this. We're still taking kind of those basic shapes that we're seeing, but just giving them a more elongated, stretched out appearance. And we can stretch them out the other direction too. So for example, uh, I'm probably going to say this wrong, but there's this really cool reptilian like crocodile creature called a gharial. I think that's how it's pronounced. They have these like ridiculously long noses like this with like these just rows and rows of sharp teeth. We could combine that with the other shapes that we're pulling from here. You know, start with that rounded half cylinder eyebrow ridge and then just create a really long maybe not quite that long, but a long nose area. Combine that with like the way that the gecko's mouth kind of goes back right into an ear hole, round that head over. 
for just mixing and matching and pulling different pieces from different reptiles to combine them together and create something completely new. We can pull some horns down the side of the face. I always try to pay attention when drawing reptiles to where the little spikes and horns are coming out of. Because with dragons, I like to like really extend them. So I might take a little spike that's only this long and make it this long. But as long as the contact point with the face feels kind of accurate to life, it'll be pretty believable. You know, we'll look at it and we'll think, yeah, it feels like a spike could be coming out of there. So with all of keeping this in mind, I'm gonna just design some little dragon creatures. <laughs> Pulling from real life animals to add believability to your creature designs is a really important skill for concept artists. Check out David Coleman's Drawing Dynamic Creatures course. You'll learn how to bring design, anatomy, and narrative together to make awesome pieces that grab your viewers' attention. That's over at proco.com slash Coleman. Why don't we start with that kind of like gecko head shape with the, with the half cylinder and actually pull it out into a full little gecko creature. People are gonna ask about your materials for sure. Oh, for sure, yeah. I like ballpoint pen because I can draw really softly with it at first and then build it up over time, kind of like pencil, but I can get pretty dark with it. I mean, this is a really simple Strathmore sketch pad, and this is a Papermate ballpoint pen. I think I got a pack of like 20 of them for maybe $5. So definitely materials that anybody can, uh, can go and get and use. Yeah, I think that's an important thing for students to know is that you know, really don't need crazy materials in order to start doing good art. You could start with stuff that you find in a classroom or just like in an office or something. Definitely. I think the materials can be really great and they can really make the art experience easier, but you don't need to go spend a bunch of money to be able to start making art for sure. <laughs> I really like sketching on drawing paper sometimes too, which is just a little bit thicker because then if I feel like adding marker, I can pretty easily and it won't bleed through to the next page, but I'll do that anyway on a on a, on a sketch paper pad if I need to. I typically will do my drawing and sketching traditionally, and then my full pieces I tend to do digitally. So my traditional materials are always pretty simple. Like my favorite pen of all time is a $2.50 Zebra felt tip brush pen. So just give this guy a little bit of an interesting pose. Something I really like from studying geckos is they get this really cool flat plane on their back like this. They've got these really like tiny noodle legs that are essentially just a, a tube with a crease in the middle, the skin folds, and then we've got another tube leading down into the arm. And you can bend them all sorts of different ways. They're actually really flexible, these tiny little lizard legs, which I find really interesting, especially compared to something like feline or a canine. They're so tiny, spindly, and, uh, and flexible. And a lot of the time, these flat planes on the back will carry on down into the tail and then kind of collapse into a single line further down. I always like to try to give my forms like a real sense of dimension and I'll draw these wrapping lines around pretty often, especially in something like this, like a, a creative creature design. I'm not worried too much about making it look like a perfect final drawing. So I will just go in and draw these wrapping lines. Anything that's giving me, the designer, a sense of the actual forms of my creature. Because like something like this, if I'm designing a, a little reptilian dragon, I want to know what the design looks like more so than I want the, the finished drawing to look really pristine, if that makes sense. Let's give this guy some little wings. I always like to do bat-like wings. Can give it one little claw curving over. Some others give it that little bit of skin right there. Just a little bit of three-dimensionality on that wing goes a long way, just having that pull forward. Something like that. Maybe it's got a little bit of a claw there. So I've got a nice base now, and I know what the planes of the body are. And like I was talking about earlier, I can start thinking about what sort of horns or other shapes I could pull into this. 
So for example, you know, we've got this flat plane of the head here, and that's kind of going down into uh, the top plane of this body that's all wrapping all the way down to here. Maybe there's like a row of horns that are starting here, starting maybe at the eyebrow, since we were talking about crested geckos earlier. And then maybe that wraps all the way down this body here and collapses into one line eventually. Still want to get some form going through here. Get that other line of spikes going on the eyebrow. Just wrap them down the side of the leg. And why don't we add some of those chin ones in too? Suddenly we've got a really spiky little guy. <laughs> Are you thinking of a storytelling when you're doing these sketching? Yeah, totally. If I'm doing a creature design, maybe I'm thinking about, you know, how it lives, what it eats. I like to draw little dragons. I like to draw dragons that are maybe the size of a dog, like a Labrador. And think about like, you know, if they're gonna be eating rabbits, where they might live. I really like to draw dragons also that could coexist in the world as it is. Uh, a, lot of my, a lot of my paintings have dragons kind of like in the modern world. So I'm always trying to think of, you know, where I could put them, like maybe on the side of a building or in somebody's garden, in a place where you might imagine that you would uh, stumble upon it, dog-sized dragons. When I was originally learning how to uh, draw animals, Peter Hahn and Jonathan Kuo were, were both really big inspirations for breaking animals down into kind of their most simple forms and being able to learn about them that way. I never actually took any creature design classes, but I would always be looking at their kind of like Instagram teaching materials and learning from those. So we've got our first little dragon here. For another one, let's do something really different. So let's pull in some totally new creature characteristics and combine them together to make another cute little guy. There's one type of lizard that has this really interesting frill around its face. Frill lizards, I've been looking at them recently. They have this really cool skin flap that goes all the way around their head. And it's actually, I think I drew it even a little bit too small. There's this little crease in the middle. It's this big skin flap. And I think I could make a cool dragon kind of pulling this and combining it with something else. So for example, let's take a really different face shape. So frilled lizards in reality have this pretty like smushed face. So maybe I could take the frill and combine it with something that has like a much longer face and create something different in that way. Like maybe like that gharial that we were uh, looking at earlier. My mom was in college for graphic design at our local community college when I was two or three, I was a toddler. And she discovered pretty early on that she could keep me occupied by sitting me down with Photoshop and a very early Wacom tablet. My first digital painting uh, in Photoshop, if you could call it a painting, is from 1999, I was two years old. And uh, I, I've pretty much just been uh, drawing and painting ever since then. I took a lot of classes with Schoolism and uh, CDA, which is a concept design, digital art, uh, like non-accredited school in Pasadena and I kind of uh, stitched together my own art education. Yeah, one of the most common questions that we get, or just I hear in general, is um, should people go to art school or not? Should they go into debt for it or not? And uh, I often hear that people will just piece together their entire art education from different classes at community colleges or workshops or unaccredited schools. And... That worked out really well for me. And you know, I think we're all different and uh, you know, all have different circumstances for sure. Uh, I know I have some friends who art school worked out really well for them, but for me, that wasn't the case. And I definitely think that the debt is uh, like really a challenging aspect for a lot of people. Um, and oftentimes not worth the specific benefits of art school, if that makes sense. What I love about the world we live in now is just how many other options that we have. Like there's so many uh, online schools and non-accredited schools. So for people like me, who the kind of traditional path didn't work out for, there's just so many, so many new options available now that they can use to 
create the art education that they want. Like, I mean, even for free, even on just using YouTube, like I know that our Proco channel has so many resources for students. I think that passion can like really carry you through. For me, just like loving it, you know, channeling that love into learning, figuring out how I learned best, that was really big for me. The classroom setting like d doesn't really work for me that well. It never has. I failed algebra two times in middle school. School was not always uh, the right environment for me. Being able to go out and take classes specifically and in what interested me, that like changed my experience with school completely. And especially being able to limit the classes that I was taking because when I went to, uh, you know, an art school for two years, your schedule is so full. You have to be doing so many things at the same time that I almost felt like I wasn't walking away with any information because I was just like learning and doing, you know, the bare minimum necessary to get the results that I needed. And I wasn't actually able to commit it to long-term memory. I felt like a lot of it was just kind of disappearing, like mist in the morning. <laughs> you know, it's interesting now that I'm older, you know, I, I'm 25 now and I'm like, I can go back and take classes in the things that I think would benefit me. And there's actually a lot of things that, you know, I wasn't interested in the time, but now I think would really benefit me. Like I never really got that traditional drawing education, like, you know, like the traditional figure drawing education. And I now am thinking about, I'm going to be going back to Watts Atelier and taking some of those courses now that I'm in a different place in my life and can focus on those things, you know, at, kind of at my own speed. So here I've taken that, like, you know, that, that frill from the frilled lizard, which one thing that I should have mentioned earlier that I think is really funny, that it, almost every time I've drawn them, they actually have their mouth open. Like if you Google frilled lizard, Almost every reference you'll find of the frilled lizard has this like big <laughs> mouth open like that. But I took this frill from the frilled lizard and put it on this like much longer face, you know, thinking of just, you know, creating a character, creating some sort of personality, thinking about like, you know, if I was going to put this in like a comic or a movie, you know, how I can take different pieces together and create something fun and interesting. Um, like. I don't know why, but what came to mind was that like this dragon likes to steal things from campers and like maybe has like uh, lots of different camping supplies that they've hoarded. So like, you know, like a little camping oven and like pieces of a tent. This is what their, their stash is made out of. Got like torn cloth and pieces of sleeping bags. I really like to do dragons that have like interesting, unique uh, stashes. Um, like I did a piece of an arcade dragon where the, the dragon had uh, like tickets and toys from the arcade that it was, that was it's like a uh, hoard that it was sitting on. So I think for this one doing like a, a, a forest camping dragon that's just been taking different, different things. Maybe it raided someone's car and got their steering wheel. Do you have any uh, thoughts on being more free flowing with your ideas and incorporating those into your drawings? You know, I had this really big breakthrough moment with my sketchbooks where it really finally clicked for me that my sketchbook was for me, which sounds really silly. You know, like I think I probably arrived at that conclusion pretty late, but I realized that when I was drawing in my sketchbook, I was always thinking about as if there was someone looking over my shoulder. And as a result, the art that I was making, I, I was not able to be really free with it because, you know, I was always worried about judgment. I was worried about making something bad, which would make me refrain from like putting lines down on the page at all. And I realized that that was a problem that I had and that that was something that was keeping me from maybe even getting to my best ideas because I was focusing so much on, you know, what other people were gonna think it was almost like I wasn't thinking about what I was going to think. And uh, I won't lie and say that I've like, you know, fixed that problem completely. But when I became aware of it, I started trying to do things that would specifically break me out of that habit of feeling like everything I, I, I drew needed to be perfect. So like I, I would purposefully draw right on top of my lines. Like, you know, I would, I would sketch right next to my final piece. I would overlap my shapes 
Uh, sometimes I would even, you know, like draw in pencil first and then draw right over the top in pen and like not even think about like what I was covering up, just trying to get, just break out of that box of feeling like I needed to be perfect and that my sketches needed to be perfect because really, you know, the, the purpose they needed to serve was uh, the ideation process, you know, figuring out the storytelling and how I can really push and pull the shapes and, and design, you know, because design is, uh, for me at least, it feels like a very different stage than, uh, you know, the actual finished illustration. But because I was so focused on my sketchbook looking pretty, I was skipping from design, this really vital stage. I was just like bypassing it and trying to make a, a, a pretty drawing. And interestingly enough, bypassing this, it, it led to like far less creative results. I was being too perfect with my sketchbook and being too perfect with my sketchbook was leading to worse results in the end. For more from Devin, go to devinlkurtz.com where you can find her books, including a new picture book about a dragon befriending a baker. It's available now for pre-order.